Hello, church. Welcome to this week's message. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's Feeding Station. It's an honor to be with you again today as we continue in the book of Isaiah. We begin chapter 7 today. It's a question of trust. Whom, in whom do we trust? We're going to talk about Ahaz today and ask that question, who, in whom does he trust? And how does that translate to us today? Uh, this section of Isaiah from now until uh, into the chapters 30 through 35, somewhere in there, it's going to talk about trust a lot. Trust is going to be a, a key subject uh, for us over the upcoming weeks and months. But the question today with the situation that Ahaz is facing, in whom does Judah trust? And I have to be careful because I've been talking about Israel and the attacks coming on Israel. Israel is still separated into two kingdoms. We have the, the, the northern kingdom and we have the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom being Judah, the northern kingdom being Israel. And so I have to be careful to delineate between the two. Um, but with this question of trust, Ahaz has to decide, is he going to trust in the nations, trust in the world, or is he going to trust in God? Now, we've seen throughout the Bible that trust in nations leads to failure, usually leads to disaster, while trust in God leads to blessing. Uh, Judah is coming under threat, has come under threat from Syria and northern Israel, and Ahaz is now in a panic, and he's got to figure out where he's going to place his trust and to whom is he going to look to for help. Unfortunately for Ahaz, he's going to turn to Assyria, and as we know history, Assyria is Judah's biggest rival, biggest enemy. Uh, it's going to be a Syria that eventually conquers Judah. So he hasn't learned from the past. He hasn't learned from history. The question for us is, are we going to learn? Are we going to figure out that trust has to be in God? Because it is all in his hands, right? His will, his plan will come to fruition no matter who or what he has to use to do it. And from Judah's coming destruction, not at the hands of Syria and northern Israel, by the way, but he will demonstrate who he is. And he's going to show himself trustworthy. Right? Well, how does he do that by bringing destruction upon his favorite nation? Because we talked about he's got to do what he's got to do because of who he is. But he's going to prove himself trustworthy because he is going to fulfill all the things that Isaiah and other prophets are prophesying about Israel. And the nation will be restored and the remnant will return. And again, we have to go back to what is Israel's purpose, right? Without, you know, going too much into depth today because we've covered it before, their purpose is to be a light unto the nations. And if she's going to realize the destiny that God has for her, she's got to trust him. The nations will constantly fail her and she's got to learn that lesson. So the, if she's going to continue to rely on the world, this is a problem because there is no light to shine because in relying on the world and adopting the ways of the world, she's bringing all that darkness in and all she then can emit is darkness, right? We know this because it's either of God or it's not. And if it's not, then it is at odds with God. And it's only when she will rely on God and trust him and obey him and submit to him that Israel will then, or will have, I know I keep saying Israel and Judah, but Israel as a nation, it's only when she trusts in God that she will have something to bring to the table. And she's actually doing a disservice to the nations around them by adopting their ways because their ways are anti-God. 
false gods, false practices, false religions, false truths. And so she's doing the nations around her a disservice because she's not bringing them the light. She's not bringing them the truth. She's not showing them what it is to be a nation under God. Kind of like where we're at today as a nation. She's got to return to God so that she can be a blessing to the world so that the promise made to Abraham can be fulfilled. And this is the struggle we all have when we face these issues that are really weighing on us. We want to control it. We want to find an answer. We want to be given an answer. We have to give up control. We have to trust God in these types of situations. We have to throw away what Oswald calls this lust for security. And we all have that. I have it big time, especially when it comes to personal health. We have to give away this lust for security and totally submit to God. So we begin today in verse one of chapter seven. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. What Isaiah is telling Ahaz here is, even though he's in a panic, and we'll talk about why he's in a panic, because there's more to this, and we'll get into the background of this. But he's in a panic because these two nations have united against him. And they've attacked him prior to this and dealt him a, a, a huge blow. But Isaiah's pronouncement is that this feared attack is not going to come. And this shows how foolish Ahaz is and how foolish we can be when we worry about things that haven't happened yet. I am the king of playing out arguments and conversations in my mind when I have something I have to deal with, right? When I have, uh, I'll give you an example of when I coach soccer and you get to tryouts and you have to make cuts, you know, you know, there's, there's conversations coming with parents. I would play it out in my head and it would never, ever go the way I thought it would. It's the same with stress, with worrying about things. Things very rarely go the way I think they're going to. And this is the problem. We get ourselves so bound up in anxiety and fear rather than, as we're told to, cast all these fears on God. Now, Assyria has been on the move. They've been dealing with nations north and east of her, but her sights are set on conquering Egypt. And this could have been the catalyst that has driven northern Israel and Syria to come after Ahaz and Judah, trying to drive her into a coalition with them to defend themselves against Assyria. Because it's obvious Assyria is looking to take and conquer as much land as she can. But by asking Assyria for help, As I said earlier, Ahaz has invited the biggest threat into his kingdom. And the big issue is it's a spiritual one because in trying to align with Assyria, it means making a treaty with her, with them, making a covenant with them. And so making a covenant with them means taking her, uh, taking Assyria's ways of life on on Judah and and adopting their gods and conceding to their lordship, Assyria's lordship. So it's a spiritual issue in doing this. And if you go back to 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28, you see that Ahaz makes this trip to Assyria, right? And this is what's driving, all of this is what's driving that trip and the prior attacks that have come. And so all this is, right, and this is, the, again, the spiritual issue. And you go, and Ahaz makes his trip. He goes to Damascus, and, and he redesigns the temple altar. 
based on what he sees in Damascus. So this alliance with them is a spiritual problem as well as a worldly problem. But in the throes of all this, Isaiah makes this announcement that Ahaz has to make a choice. Trust Assyria, deny God, or trust God and turn your back on the ways of the world. Leave it all in his hands. So verse 2, when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Okay, the house of David, Isaiah says, is running scared. Why? Now, let's go back and and talk about a little bit of history that's led up to this point. If you go to 2 Chronicles 28, and there's an account of this in 2 Kings as well. But 2 Chronicles 28, 5 says, Therefore, the Lord his God gave him, Ahaz, into the hand of the king of Syria, who defeated him, and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. If you go back to the verses prior to this, we find out that when Ahaz takes the throne, he behaves as the kings before him did, not walking with God, uh, worshiping false gods. And so Ahaz is at odds with God, and God handed him over. Syria and Israel uh, attacked the outlying areas of Judah and took a lot of captives, and it was a major defeat for Ahaz. And because of this, rightfully so, Ahaz is terrified. Now, on top of this, you have the Edomites and the Philistines. Second Chronicles, farther down, 28, 17, and 18. For the Edomites had again invaded and defeated Judah and carried away captives. And the Philistines had made raids on the cities in the Shephelah and the Negev of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Ajalon, Gedaroth, Soko with its villages, Timnah with its villages, and Gimzo with its villages. And they settled there. So... Ahaz is under threat on multiple fronts. And to top it off, the enemy has made it clear that if they conquer Judah, they're going to replace Ahaz with a puppet of their own. And if that's the case, that probably means death for Ahaz and his family. You don't conquer a land and leave a remnant alive to cause trouble down the road. So verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Ahaz is believed now to be making preparations for war. And at this point, it's not till Hezekiah that there is a source of water that runs into the city. There are these pools in the outlying areas that that Judah would get their water from, And so it's believed that that's where Ahaz is. He's out there uh, checking and making sure that they have enough supply for the siege he believes is coming. And this is where Isaiah finds him. And he brings his son along as told by God. Now, why bring his son along? Well, again, nothing happens in a vacuum. Uh, Everything happens for a reason. And uh, Shir Jashub means uh, that the, the... meaning of that name is a remnant will return. And that's pretty significant. Now, the question is, are the implications of this, having Isaiah's son there, are the implications positive or negative? Does bringing his son mean that the destruction of Judah will come, but it won't be total? Or does it mean destruction is coming And it will be so devastating that all that will be left is a remnant. Okay, we really don't know. God doesn't make that clear what his purpose was for having Isaiah's son there. But what it it does mean, or for us, what we can't lose sight of, is that God's purposes here in Judah's destruction, 
the destruction part is not the be all and end all. Having Isaiah's son there tells us that there will be a remnant that will return and Israel will, will be restored and, and that God still has a plan for her. So the destruction part is the suffering part, is the in the fire remove the dross part of all of this. But he still has plans for her. He still has a desire for her to realize her, her reason for being created uh, not, and, and having the covenant with him. So the destruction isn't the end of this. So knowing what we know now of, of uh, Ahaz's prior defeats, it's more likely that seeing Isaiah's son now and knowing what his son's name means, it just adds to the terror. It adds to the anxiety. Okay, destruction is coming. God has had Isaiah bring his son. There's only going to be a remnant left. Okay. And now it just, he's running in circles uh, in fear and anxiety. And in the face of this, he's, he's losing sight of what's the plan here? What is really going on here? And what am I to do about all of this? How am I supposed to handle this? Isaiah's son's presence there means a remnant will survive. No, no matter how big the army, no matter how complete the devastation. And there should be hope in that. And there should be reliance on that. But the fact that Ahaz has not ruled in lockstep with God probably means that he doesn't know God as well as he should. And hence, he doesn't trust him. So verses four through eight. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephra, uh, Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within 65 years Ephraim will be shattered from being a people." Isaiah's telling Ahaz, dude, chill, just chill, relax. These two clowns are just merely, uh, what's the smoldering stumps, right? They're, the, the fire, the bonfire may have been big at, at one point, but two burnt sticks are all that's left, right? Their 15 minutes is up. You gotta just chill out. And again, I have sympathy for Ahaz because you know, in the face of all of this, you can understand his worry, especially when you look at this from a political perspective. Right? This isn't just a raid by Syria and northern Israel. This is an annexation. They want to take it over. They want to install their puppet governor, and they want a ruler who is going to do their bidding. That's what they want. And it's just like today. You see it with the big nations controlling the small nations. U.S. does it. Russia does it. Europe does it. Everybody, this is, the, and, and, I, and again, not to be political. It's just, this is the behavior of man. This is what kings do. This is what God warned us about in Samuel. This is what they do. So this is no different today. But Isaiah says it's not going to happen. This is where the trust comes in again. He's got to trust Isaiah. And, and this, is, this is the thing. How do we test prophets? <coughs> Excuse me. We test prophets by whether or not their prophecies come true. Well, Isaiah has been proven true 
already up to this point. And so Isaiah's passed the test. Does Ahaz realize that, see that? And can he now lean into God because he knows he's got to realize that God is speaking through Isaiah? He's got to get out of his finite mind and understand God is the one with the power. God is the one who's in control. God is the one that has limitless understanding. God is the one that sees the whole picture and has a plan here. That's where Ahaz has got to get to. That's where we have to get to on a daily basis, no matter what we're facing. And he's got to realize that what is happening to Ahaz and Judah has nothing to do with Syria and Northern Israel. Has nothing to do with those leaders. This has all to do with God. And when we face face situations that bring on this type of anxiety, if we know God, we know He loves us. We know that He intends good for us. That, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself here as well, that should take away the fear and the dread from what we're facing. If God truly loves us, then what He has allowed into our lives is for a reason. And so the question should be, not why me, God, but what are you showing me? What do I have to learn in this and through this? And maybe it's just being more obedient. Maybe it's just being less headstrong. Maybe it's just being less in trying to be in control of our own lives and giving it up to Him. You know, when it comes to physical ailments, you find out very quickly that you have no control, especially as you get older. Those of you who are, you know, in your 50s and 60s, I'm sure you, you're, you're, you're realizing the body slowly fails over time. You don't recuperate. You're not as strong as you used to be. Things don't work as well as they once did. That's just life, but it can be scary at times, but we really have no control over that. And that is where we have to know and trust God in the process. And, and then when we face these things, how do we respond? Do we respond with continual thanksgiving and continual trust and continual love and continual obedience and continual surrendering? Or do we try to manage the situation and worry about it and be fearful over it? I'm guilty as charged. I do, I do the, the, the back half of that all the time. And it, I have, yeah, I got to work at it. I got to work at it. But that's where we need to be. And this is Ahaz's test. He's, Ahaz is required to show faith, to show faith in God. Even though he's not walked with him up to this point, God has put Isaiah in his life for a reason. And he's got to trust God and rely on him and just sit back, be obedient, and watch this all play out. And it's the same with those people in this time waiting for Messiah to come. It's the same for us waiting for Jesus to return. We have to have faith. No matter what chaos is going on in the world, we have to remain faithful and trusting in God. So last verse today, verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. Right? This sums it up, doesn't it? Ahaz has to acknowledge that God is sovereign. I, I, I hear people use the term sometimes, I used to do it, God is in control. Um, he's not in control in the sense that he's a puppet master. He is sovereign. He is on the throne. And Ahaz has got to put himself in God's hands. He's got to put Judah in God's hands and trust God and be obedient. If he doesn't, they all will continue to live their lives in perpetual fear constantly worrying, okay, who's next? 
And the point of this, and I'm, I'm going to tie this into what we're going through today, is that if they would repent and turn to God, you really have to ask the question then, would Babylon and the exile have happened? If they would have turned, much like Nineveh, Nineveh was granted a reprieve until they stepped back into their sin. If Israel were to turn and repent and follow God, would they have been conquered by Babylon? Because Assyria is not the answer. It's going to be something God uses to get and teach Israel a lesson, teach Judah a lesson, but they're not the answer to Judah's problems. God is the answer. Trusting in God, trusting in the covenant that he made with the nation. That's the answer. That's where the only true security lies. And, and we have to remember that when it comes to speaking, you know, in this country, in the United States, with the upcoming election. You've heard me say this a thousand times, and I will continue to say this over the next, what, 60 some days, wherever we are in the election cycle. We have to trust God. God is the only one, turning back to God is the only way that we get back on sure footing. And it is the only way that we can turn the United States around and get it back on its feet and back to what God intended it to be. Donald Trump isn't going to save us. Kamala Harris isn't going to save us. Your mayors and your city councils and your senators and your Congress people, congressmen, congresswomen, they're not going to save us. They are not the spiritual foundations that we need to reestablish to get this country back on its feet. And until we repent, we're going to be in the same spot as Judah and Ahaz. Constantly worrying, constantly trying to figure it out for ourselves, constantly trying to find somebody, some nation, right? Uh, Ahaz is turning to Assyria. We're going to be turning to, uh, if it's not Trump, then it's the next guy. It's J.D. Vance. If it's not uh, Kamala, it's Tim Waltz. If it's not him, who next? We just keep moving from failure to failure to failure to failure. And, and we wonder why we're in the mess we're in. We need to turn to God. God is the only surety that we have for a solid nation that lives in accordance with God's truth. Till we repent and turn back to him, we're just going to be spinning our wheels like Ahaz and Judah in the times of Isaiah. And so uh, I hope we can figure that out. And as, as we pray, as we pray, pray for your nation, pray for your cities, pray for your towns, pray for your states, pray for your leaders, pray that God will raise up people for his sake, right? To bring honor and glory to him, that they will allow the Holy Spirit to guide them in leading all of us as a nation back to God in a spirit of repentance. With that too, while we're talking about prayer, uh, thinking about and talking about a day of prayer uh, or maybe a couple days of prayer and fasting as we uh, run up to the election, talking to Craig James about this and, and talking about doing it in conjunction with him and his radio show, Just Informed Talk Radio. Uh, as we iron out the details, if that's something that's going to happen and that's something we're going to call for, uh, I will make sure that uh, y'all know that. But that's what we're doing. So pray for us. Pray for the spirits leading in this, uh, that we're not just doing this in our own strength, but we're doing this because it's something that needs to be done from a God faith perspective for uh, for our nation. So with that, I hope you all have uh, a great week. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for your prayers. And Lord willing, I'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.